Grenade by Alan Gratz, part one, pages 24 through 30. Ray, Love Day. Blood pounded in Ray's ears as he staggered into the waist-high surf, his heart beating a thousand times a second. His helmet slid down over his eyes again, and he struggled to push it up. He plunged headlong through the waves and tried to keep his rifle out of the water. The pack on his back felt like it weighed ten tons and was going to drag him down with it. Stay low, don't bunch up, and run like hell, he repeated to himself. He high-stepped the waves when he could, separating himself from the other marines so they wouldn't make such easy targets. He crouched low, his whole body clenched in anticipation of the machine gun fire, which never came. Only after he'd scrambled over the broken remains of seawall and lurched up onto the beach did Ray realize there was nobody to shoot, and nobody shooting at him. Besides the giant craters left by the Navy's artillery, it was just a white, sandy beach with low, rolling green hills beyond. No ten-foot seawall, no mines, no barbed wire, no machine gun nests, nothing. There's got to be some mistake, thought Ray. Where are all the bodies, the wrecked vehicles, the machine guns, and mortars everyone had promised would blow them apart? One of the Sherman tanks fitted out with pontoons to help it through the surf clank to a stop nearby. The tank commander popped up from the top hatch to see it with his own two eyes. He tipped his helmet back and scratched his head, clearly as perplexed as Ray and everyone else. Out at sea, Japanese kamikazes were buzzing the American and British battleships like flies. But here on the island, the Japanese army wasn't putting up any resistance at all. The rest of Ray's company splashed up around them. Where are the Japs? Someone asked. Looks like they've taken a powder, said one of the guys. Man, this is almost scarier than being shot at, Big John said. He propped his big browning automatic rifle on his shoulder. The browning what the others called a bar, was so heavy it came with its own bipod to rest the barrel on. But Big John was so strong, he carried it the way Ray carried his much lighter rifle. Did the Navy barrage kill them all? Ray asked. Big John shook his head. At sea while we walked over, yeah, but there weren't nobody defending it or there'd be bodies all over the place. Man, I've been on vacations tougher than this, another Marine said with a laugh. Stay alert and don't get cocky, Sergeant Meredith said, cutting through the chatter. You don't want to die laughing. That shut them all up. Up and down the beach, sergeants and lieutenants pulled squads and companies together out of the chaos. Ray and Big John and the sergeant were part of Easy Company, the nickname for Company E. Ray's squad came together and they tiptoed their way up to the top of the dunes at the edge of the beach. There was nothing beyond that except for a patchwork of farms as far as they could see. Looks like you're getting that nickname after all, kid, Big John said, and Ray smiled in spite of himself. That was supposed to have been a meat grinder, had been a cakewalk instead. His pack was suddenly light as air, and he felt like he could march for days. Well, heck, I already lived longer than I thought I would, so I'm happy, said Private First Class Billy Lineker a red-headed 19-year-old from Fort Mill, South Carolina. Everybody called him Hard Luck Lineker because he'd been shot in the butt at Peleliu and recovered just in time to get himself sent to Okinawa. I never heard of this Okinawa place until a couple of weeks ago, said Private Francisco Gonzalez. He hailed from Visalia, California, and though he wasn't as big and burly as Big John, he was the squad's other bar gunner. Like Ray, he was a new recruit. Why we even want it? We've been playing leapfrog through the Pacific, explained Corporal Travis Starks. Everybody called Starks old man, the old man because he was 24 and married with twin daughters back home in Lee Summit, Missouri. Island to island to island. This is the last rock before we jump to Japan. We take Okinawa and it's next stop, Tokyo. This is Japan, technically speaking, said Sergeant Meredith. Even though it's its own island with its own people, it's still a prefecture of Japan, like one of our states back home. I don't think the Japs are going to give it up without a fight. Everyone nodded, and Ray's pack started to feel a little heavier. All right, we got to hump half a click east by nightfall to secure the area around the landing beach, Sergeant Meredith said. 
Ray knew that this meant they had to march east with all their gear for half a kilometer. Half a click by nightfall, the old man said. That's crazy. If Okinawa's anything like Pelelu, there'll be caves full of Japanese soldiers all over the place. We won't get a hundred yards before we're pinned down. Our orders are half a click by nightfall, so we make it half a click by nightfall, Sergeant Meredith said firmly. He showed them a map of the immediate area. East Company will spread out here, along this road, heading east. The rest of the 1st Marines will have it north above us, and the Army's 96th Division will flank us on the right, and then make a hard right turn south. Time's a waste, and let's move out. Ray's squad got walking down a dirt road through some of the prettiest countryside he'd ever seen. Neat little fields grew rice and beans and sweet potatoes and sugar cane. Thatch-roofed farmhouses set nestled among forests of pine and bamboo and some kind of strange tree that Ray had never seen before. It had a dozen trunks instead of one, and a big round canopy on top with vines growing straight down like the stingers of, on a jellyfish. In the distance, the farms rolled up into bright green hills and mountains. All in all, it could have been paradise if they hadn't been there to fight the Japanese. But there was something else wrong with it, too. And finally, Ray put his finger on it. There weren't any people. Yes, he could see other rifle squads from East Company to the left and right, working their way cautiously through fields and forests. But there wasn't a single Okinawan around. Where had they all gone? Had they all been evacuated by the Japanese? Hey, look here! Hard luck Lineker cried, breaking the silence. They were passing by another farm, and he pointed, A pig! Sure enough, whoever had worked this farm had gone so quickly they'd left behind what looked like a year-old pig. Ray's squad collected at the fence to its pen to watch it snuffling around in the muck. Man, I ain't had a good pork chop in ages, Big John moaned. We ought to kill it and cook it up, said Gonzalez. They all looked to the sergeant, expecting a no, but he was licking his lips. I'm right there with you, boys, but I'm a plumber. I don't know nothing about slaughtering any pig. Anybody else? They all shook their heads, except for Ray. A horrible moment from a few years ago on the farm flashed through his mind, and he looked away, trying to forget. Slaughtering this pig would bring up a lot of bad memories for him, but the boys wanted it so bad, and Ray was so eager to earn their friendship. I do, Ray said at last. We used to do it every year back on the farm. His squad mate's eyes went wide and suddenly Ray was the most popular guy on all of Okinawa. What do you say, Sergeant? Can we do it? Sergeant Meredith thought on it. Well, we're already way ahead of schedule and I'd sure like me some ribs. The other men of Ray's squad hooted and hollered and slapped him and the sergeant on their backs. All right, all right, Sergeant Meredith said. Don't make too much noise about it or the other squads will hear and want a taste. Hard luck climbed up on the fence to go over into the pen after the pig. Pack! Something popped in the distance and suddenly hard luck Lineker looked confused. His head dropped to his chest where a dark liquid was spreading across the front of his uniform. He wobbled and fell over forward. Ray didn't understand what was going on until Big John tackled him. Get down! Get down! Sergeant Meredith cried. Sniper! 